Let's now take you to the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, where the Ria Kota lectures is expected to begin anytime soon. And the keynote speaker is son of um, uh, Mr. Akuto, who is who happens to be Ghana's Minister of Agric, Dr. Ifri uh, Osei Akuto. Well, you see the dignitaries there. This is under the auspices of the Chief Justice. And... Um, Bafo Osekoto is uh, credited with a lot of successes in, in Ghana's development, and even for the NPP's formation and development. So we see in our shots there the former Speaker of Parliament, Professor Reverend Michael Quay. We see uh, the Agri Minister who is the keynote speaker at this event. So we expect that it will start anytime soon. And... Uh, we will stay through to uh, till about 12 when this ends. So let's take you live to the Ken USD campus. Shall we be seated? Bafour Osei Akutu and others who taught us that fidelity to principles, courage, patience, resilience, and collective action do yield results. They fought with intelligence, guts, steely determination, and patriotism to liberate our land and reclaim our worth as human beings. Their love for country continues to inspire generations of us to commit our lives to the search of an enduring democratic legacy for Ghana. This is a quotation from the inaugural speech by His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Ghana, Nanadu Dankwa Kufuadu, on the 7th of January 20. 17. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here for the 16th edition of the Re Akutu Memorial Lectures under the auspices of His Lordship, the Chief Justice of the Republic of Ghana, His Lordship Justice Eni Yabwa, the management of the Ghana School of Law, and the SRC of the Ghana School of Law. Shall we at this juncture invite Reverend Father Dr. Anthony Na, Head of College Chaplaincy, KNUST, to lead us in an opening prayer? Shall we receive the Reverend Father? May I beg your indulgence to please rise for prayer? Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Almighty and ever-living God, we are grateful to you for the gift of our lives. We thank you for this day and we thank you for this moment. You have gathered us today to celebrate in a very special way the 16th edition of the R. Akoto Memorial Lectures. We thank you for the life of the Osei Akoto family and what they represented for us as a nation. We thank you for the School of Law. We thank you for the Faculty of Law of KNUST. And we thank you for all the stakeholders and all those who uphold our Constitution, promote our human rights. We entrust this gathering into your care. Send your Holy Spirit into our midst 
direct us in all that we do and at the end of it all we may understand the importance of law human rights and help best to promote them in our lives we thank you for the safe arrival of all our dignitaries and we thank you for who they are and what they represent for us as a nation and as a people and we thank you for using them as your own instrument to lead us as a nation we pray that you continue to govern us direct us and bless us in all we do these are many blessings we ask through christ our lord amen thank you very much reverend father dr anthony Na. Ladies and gentlemen, anytime soon we'll be introducing to you the chairman for this occasion. But before we do so, let us honor the following dignitaries who are here present. In course of time, others who will join us will also be introduced to you. We have with us this morning the representative of the chief justice of the republic of ghana he is in the person of his lordship justice dennis aj justice of the courts of appeal representing the chief justice we also honored to have in our miss the Honorable Minister of Justice and Attorney General of the Republic of Ghana, Honorable Godfrey Yabuadame. We have with us the former Speaker of Parliament, Right Honorable Reverend Professor Aaron Mike Okay. We have the Honorable Dr. Usu Efri Yakuto, Minister of Agriculture. We have the director, the acting director of the Ghana School of Law, Mr. Maxwell Upoku Ajman with us. Let's also welcome Mr. Kwame Pienim, an economist and a person I would describe as a statesman. He's also here with us, Mr. Kwame Pienim. Mr. Michael Jan Ousu is also here with us. We have the representative of the Asante Hinutun Force 82, the second, in the person of Nana Bafo EJ Fosu. Nana, shall we? Let me also introduce to you the Dean of the KNUST Faculty of Law, Professor Lydia Porinkansa. We also have with us Mr. Paul Edugemfi, lecturer and past president, Ghana Bar Association with us. Ladies and gentlemen, shall we now have Ajua Sewa Asamwa to introduce the chairman for this occasion? Shall we receive Ajua Sewa Asamwa? Mr. Chairman, Honorable Guest Speaker, 
Distinguished Guest of Honor, Professor Michael Quay. Representative of the Chief Justice, His Lordship Justice, Dennis A.J. The Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Honorable Godfrey Dami. Nana Nom. The Acting Director of the Ghana School of Law, Mr. Maxwell Opokuajiman. All other dignitaries present. Management and staff of the Ghana School of Law. The SRC of the Ghana School of Law. Students, ladies and gentlemen. I stand here giving the singular honor to introduce the chairman for this program, the 16th edition of the Ria Koto Memorial Lectures. He is an economist who has had a distinguished career in investment and economic advisory services, both in Ghana and abroad. He worked as a civil servant and a public servant in Ghana after serving as an economic research officer of the United Nations in New York. A former acting principal secretary of the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning, he served as an advisor to the minister in devising a market-oriented development strategy and policies. While at the ministry, he helped structure and transform the social fund under the then State Insurance Corporation, SIC, into the Social Security and National Insurance Trust, SNIT. As a private consultant, he designed and established the Teachers Fund, a monthly put-aside savings for the Ghana National Association of Teachers, NATS, which is now a major investment fund in Ghana. He is a former chief executive of Ghana Cocoa Marketing Board. He has also served as a chairman on the boards of the following. The Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, Ghana International School, Airtel Tigo Communications Ghana, Bayport Savings and Loans PLC, and, Bank, and United Bank for Africa Ghana. He was also a member of the Petroleum Commission. He was educated at Echina Krum Methodist School and at Achimota School. He is a former president of the old Achimotan Association. He holds a Master of Arts degree in Economics from Yale University, USA, and a BA double honors in economics and political science from the University of New Brunswick, Canada, where he studied as a Commonwealth scholar. He has participated in a number of development and good governance related seminars, both home and abroad, and served as a member of the United Nations Development Program, specifically on the Commission on Private Sector and Development. Under the PNDC regime, he was detained and sentenced by the public tribunal to 18 years imprisonment with hard labor and spent 10 years in jail. In January 2001, he was granted an absolute and, un and unconditional pardon. In 2002, he received the apostolic blessings of His Holiness Pope John Paul II for the meritorious service to the parish on the occasion of the Golden Jubilee of Christ the King Parish Accra. In recognition of his public service, he was awarded a member of the Order of the Volta. He is married to Cornelia Anapienim, Nii Den Hartog, and they are blessed with a daughter and two sons. Ladies and gentlemen, with a round of applause, let us welcome the chairman of this program, Mr. Kwame Pieni. Thank you very much. They say when technology fails, it's a shame that in the premier science and technology University of Ghana, my iPad is not working. But there's a backup. The representative of Otunfo, Opokuare, Nana Nantahini, my father, my 
my grandfather and my brother. The last time I said that, the British High Commissioner asked me, how can he be your grandfather, your father, and your brother? And he says, and I said, he's my grandfather because that is my mother's father. And he's my brother because we both sit on that stool. So I'm a royal of Ananta, and I'm happy, Nana, that we are representing Otumfo. Jose Tutu II, who established this memorial lecture in honor of Ochiame Bafo Ose Akutu, who served his nation and the Golden Stool with loyalty and a selfless uh, manner. Thank you, Nana, and through you to Otunfo for this memorial lecture, which has not been a one-day wonder like most others, that has continued for all these 16 edition, up to the 16th edition. The Right Honorable Michael Quay, former speaker, who understands perfectly what this Re Akutu means. When my friend Yao Safumafu said, we all eat macroeconomics. People didn't understand it. Macroeconomics is bread and butter. And Re Akutu is not just for lawyers, as the list of distinguished speakers have demonstrated. It is what keeps us alive, free to go about our business. May, may I, through you, Nana, also salute Nananum, who are here, gracing this event in honor of one of their colleagues who served the Golden Stool. Your Lordship, representing the Chief Justice, Enim Yeboah, Chief Justice of the Republic, of Ghana, under whose distinguished auspices we are holding this 16th Re Akutu lecture. And through you, Your Lordship, may I also salute all members of the judiciary here present uh, with us uh, today. The Attorney General. May I, through you, also salute all ministers here with us and all members of parliament, all members of political parties and executives who are here with us today. Mr. Maswalopuku Ajman, Director of Legal Education and your colleagues in the faculty, you who have taken on the onerous but laudable task of organizing these annual lectures, congratulations for coming so far. Not too many people have been able to hold something like this for so long. We started the Kublai Nu lectures to honor people in the media who are also abused. It didn't last, it died. And I hope the Media Commission, the Journalist Association, will revive it and keep it going. Because if we forget our history, we will not grow. The 
Honorable Osuye Free Yakoto, Minister for Food and Agriculture, and keynote speaker of the and also the 18th child of the inimitable and amazing Bafo Akutu. I felt a little bit jealous when Chinese, some Chinese friends were going about how great this man is, a free, fantastic man. They were negotiating. They decided to continue the negotiation over dinner. And the Chinese, they would toast you, Kambe, and you have to down all your drink. And they were drinking brandy. They were doing it. They've done it with other Ghanaians. After 30 minutes, 40 minutes, the rest, they've succumbed. And I was saying, how great this man is. I got a little jealous later. I said, don't mind him. He's not even half the man his father was. I said, what do you mean? I said, his father had 36 children. He, can't, he hasn't even been able to produce four or five. But honorable, that was out of jealousy. <laughs> this man is responsible for one and two of the four pillars that will make sure that the party that his father fought so hard to help us establish that this party will break the genes of the two terms of the eight elections that we've had, NDC has won four, MPP has won four. If the Minister for Agriculture, for Food and Agriculture, is able to mechanize and rejuvenate, rehabilitate agriculture to increase output and remove the yield deficit. Everything we produce in Ghana, we only attain 50% of the attainable world yield. Maize, rice, whatever, cocoa, name it. If it's able to improve and overcome that yield deficit, and the one district, one factory gets the output to process in the districts where the young people live and stay, they will be able to have good paying jobs to stay in the districts so that they don't come to the towns, Accra, Kumasi, to burden the already overtasked infra social infrastructure. Those are the two pillars. The other two pillars, free senior high school to improve the quality of our manpower for development. And the fourth one is stopping putting a stop to bribery and corruption that has been holding us back for all these years. So he is responsible for two. And if he's able to do that, we'll break the chains and we'll continue to establish what Bafu Akoto fought for. I am here today for three reasons, as a, somebody trained in the classics, I always have to give three reasons. The first reason for my being here and accepting readily and gladly to be chairman of this event is because of the high respect I hold for Ochiame Bafo Akutu. When you are in prison or accused of sins related to Secession, subversion. Nobody wants to be associated with you. Bafwa Kutu knew what it felt like. He came all the way to Insawen Prison to visit Apia Minka and myself. Oh, now that day, he came, he sat with us, and he said, oh, I see you are now playing football. He was like a doctor with bedside manners. Oh, 
and that the prison no cry a yakakra mobile football it's not was seven days in isolation and half ration and you were in a room three meters by three meters by four meters no windows that's what they went through was he consoled us and made us feel that's what the end you come out wiser and better than you are now the second reason while I'm here is that the extent and the structure of Bafuakutu in the struggle for independence has not been fully made known, narrated to us. Most people associate Bafuakutu with the organizing platform that he used the Matimu slogan, which was to demonstrate to the British who knew that Ghana would not be viable without Ashanti joining the colonies. That we're not going to go until we have some form of checks and balances on a centralized government. When people see our chiefs with their gold ornaments, they think that is all. They only see the flowers on top of the trees. They fail to see the roots that firmly ground all of us as human beings. And what Balfour was fighting for was that our chiefs would not run away and leave their sandals, but they would stay to be respected and give direction and leadership to us. What Balfour was fighting for was that the entrepreneurship of cocoa farmers and the other uh, people who work in Ghana would not be subsumed under state farms for us to have a monochronistic state enterprises and socialist society. The 1992 Constitution is a vindication of the politics that Bafua could do fought for. Not the Asante secessionist, that's what we we'll try to label him. Bafua Kutu, both in the UP tradition and the development of Ghana, is the proverbial thumb. Kukumutia, Wintimin San, Humopo. We need to recognize him as such. And the third reason why I wanted to be here was let people know Ray Akoto and seven others. It's not just for lawyers. You read the eminent people who have been giving speeches here. It's not for lawyers. It's for all of us. When you see the seven others who were with Bafu Akoto, a produce manager, a farmer, a transport owner, a driver, a chief, these were the ordinary people of Ghana. And I wanted to encourage the organizers on Otunfo that when we move, we should move more aggressively to the objectives of the lecture, which was to promote research study. And when we move to the research part and somebody goes to the colonial archives and to research what Prempe the second and Ochiame Bafuakoto were doing with the regional commissioner here. I've been privileged enough to know one of the key persons who was there. You remember in the olden days when you call the regional ministry, the telephonist will pick it and give it. And Bafuakoto is such a selfless individual. He always pushes people forward, pushing 
Bouzia forward. Most people forget that Bouzia and Olenu, they were going to form their own party, Gold Coast, Gold Coast Convention Party. Babafo was always saying, Kofi, remember Boye, more crash for me, come and help us. Dr. J.B. Dankwa, he and Bafo understood royalty. And they said, let us build Ghana into an Adishiman Ghana. Why Adishiman? If all of us understood we were royals, a policeman cannot in front of TV be saying how he gave orders to his people to whip women our mothers, we don't treat royals that way. And I'm hoping that this aspirational Ghana of Bafua Koto and JB Dankwa, a Ghana of royals, will move on so that all of us will be treated like royals. <laughs> so my plea is to encourage you Let's move into the research sector. And the, 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 the political scientists will then have to research, go to the colonial office, and see the discussion between Bafua Koto and them, which led to the constitution that we won independence with. We are regional assemblies that were a check on the central government. The chiefs had a role to play a check. But due to the lack of political strategy of Balfour's team that was in parliament, when Nkrumah moved a bill to remove those, Nkrumah was advised, accept them, otherwise we are not going to have independence. Ashanti will not be part of it. So he accepted it reluctantly. And once independence came, he moved a motion to repeal it. Unfortunately, Balfour's team in parliament worked out, and the CPP had a majority. They passed the bill in parliament. They, and then, when he came to the assembly, the regional, our politicians also there walked away, and the CPP that were left passed the bill. So what Balfour fought for was removed. But as I said, the 1992 Constitution is a justification, vindication of Balfour. There, private entrepreneurship was recognized. So cocoa prices that were being taxed 70, 80%, as chief executive, the farmer was getting only 20% of the FOB price. Fortunately, the revolutionaries who wanted to uh, throw away chieftaincy helped recognize chieftaincy. And then Rawlings started, moved it to about 40. President Kufoke moved it to 60. And now Bafua Kuto's son is sitting there. And I hope he's making sure it's 70, 75 percent. <laughs> and I'm hoping the time is coming and the time has already come for the cocoa marketing board to be handed over to the cocoa farmers of this nation to be made into a cooperative and no longer part of the Ghana government. The cocoa farmers have carried this nation for far too long. And I'm hoping that as you begin to expand the Ray Akoto lectures, to include a now an agriculturist, a farmer. I'm always jealous of him. This PhD from Cambridge University is one of the big farmers. And it is him we are looking forward to, to mechanize farming. And that when we expand this, and you've already started expanding it, making it more inclusive, by having an agriculturist as your lecturer today. And I hope that the honor we can do to Balfour 
I've always been saying that maybe we need an airport, international airport, Bafua Kutu International Airport. But I was thinking about it. <laughs> Bafua is so selfless. He was pushing people. You know, a lot of the people didn't even on that, didn't know that Bafua spoke English well enough to be conversing with the regional commissioner. Eh? One day, their meetings were somehow this, and so uh, the regional commissioner called Bafo, and the guests at the reception went and they were calling the others, hey, Bafo came Bafo, meet you. And Bafo speaks very softly, and in English, he speaks even more softly. I'm hoping that this memorial lectures will be transformed by this nation into, and that's it an institute for civic education where lawyers, social scientists, psychiatrists will meet. The psychiatrist will study we are, why we are so envious that whenever there is a coup, we report one another. And then they will also give us a template for recruiting policemen and soldiers, security service people, so that the psychopaths are withered away from them and then will be treated as dignitaries. I apologize for taking this long, and I will not hold you any longer from listening to the story of Bafu Akutu. And let me congratulate Bafu Akutu's family and the other families. And I think today we also owe the family condolences on the passing of one of uh, our main speakers, uh, sisters, who is also a lawyer. So thank you very much, and I'll give the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, shall we have the acting director of the Ghana School of Law, Mr. Maxwell Opokwajman, to give us the welcome address. Mr. Maxwell Opokwajman. Chairman Nana Anantahini presenting O2 for His Lordship Dennis Yao IJ, Judge of the Court of Appeal, representing the Chief Justice, Mr. Honorable Godfrey Yabu Adami, Attorney General and Minister of Justice. Right Honorable Michael Quay, Professor and Reverend, former Speaker of Parliament, Dr. Uswafri Yakuto, our main speaker, the Registrar of the Ghana School of Law, the Dean of the Faculty of Law, KUST, the Coordinator of the Kumasi Campus, my laws, High Court judges present, management of the Ghana School of Law, my colleague lecturers, Students, distinguished guests, honorable family of Seb Bafua Kuto, ladies and gentlemen. I am very delighted today because, first and foremost, this program started 16 years ago, but I can say today is the most attended and most successfully organized. And I thank the local organizing committee the SRC, and the management of the law school for this wonderful 
occasion. We have gathered here today to remind ourselves of the importance of the decision in the case of Akuto and seven others with the Republic in the evolution of constitutional law in Ghana. In the study of constitutional law, especially constitutional interpretation, the importance attached to the meaning and distinction between the English words shall and should has never been lost. In Riyakoto, of which the facts are legendary, and in the name of which we are congregated here, the Supreme Court strenuously drew the attention of counsel to the, dif to the difference and the distinction between the use of shall and should in the construction of Article 13 of the 1960 Constitution. It was the wisdom of the then Supreme Court that should falls in a category of lighter imperativeness, almost to the same level as may, and that the phrase that follows should in that article, especially the provision, no person should be deprived of a freedom, is a command that does not need to be completed or mandatorily enforced. The position of the Supreme Court in Akoto had been variously criticized, and it seems that in all cases, Ghanaians in Coral Sink have echoed loud and clear that never again should we revert to the consideration or declaration of fundamental human rights of citizens as equal to a coronation oath of a Queen of England or a mere political talk not to be taken seriously. Indeed, the drafters of the 1969 Constitution had this to say in page 45 of the proposals for the 1969 Constitution, where they quoted the decision of Akoto in extenso as follows. And with your permission, I quote, the contention that the legislative power of parliament is limited by Article 13 of the Constitution is in direct conflict with express provisions of Article 20. It will be observed that Article 31 is in the form of personal declaration by the President and is no way part of the general law of Ghana. In other parts of the Constitution where a duty is imposed, the word shall is used. In our view, the declaration may represent the goal to which every President must pledge himself to attempt to achieve. It does not represent a legal enforcement which can be enforced by the courts. The drafters in response to the above statement by the Supreme Court had this to say, a paragraph 179 of their report. And I quote, we do not believe that any authority should be above the law. We appreciate that a government should have authority to govern. But if that government is not to be arbitrary and tyr tyrannical, we conceive that restrictions there must be upon how far it can go in regulating the lives of those who are under its authority. Our people are unanimous in that the proposed constitution for Ghana should set out in detail the rights of the individual and of the state in what may be considered a declaration of liberty under the law. It is not without a significance that in some cases it was even suggested that there should be no limitations at all on the fundamental freedoms of the individual. Yet, liberty is not a license. Clearly, the case and decision of Akoto serve as a precursor for the inclusion of provisions for the protection of fundamental human rights, not as a mere political declaration, but as an enforceable bill of rights. No wonder the preamble of the 1969 Constitution provided as follows, which I quote, we, the chiefs and people of Ghana, having experienced a regime of tyranny, remembering with gratitude the heroic struggle against oppression, having solemnly resolved never again to allow ourselves to be subjected to a like regime. Akoto Memorial Leches is therefore to serve as a reminder to Ghanaians, lest we forget. A stark reminder of the timorousness of the then Supreme Court 
in the case of Akoto, was stated by Dr. Bajiesi. In the case of the Republic versus Fast Track High Court, Accra, S. Patish Raj, Honorable Dr. Anani, interested party, which he said, and I quote, in responding to this question, I am deeply mindful that this is a timorous soul or bold spirit movement to borrow the famous categories memorably formulated in Candler and Crane Christmas by Denning LJ as he then was. I am on this occasion inclined to be a bold spirit and not to succumb to what will be a stunning failure of strategic vision of re Akoto dimensions. The importance of Akoto in constitutional reasoning may also be seen in the following statements by my humble self in a paper entitled Maintaining the Discipline of Judicial Interpretation When Shah Shah Bishah delivered at the Ri Akoto Memorial Lecture in 2013 as a critique of the Supreme Court decision in the presidential petition Akufuado and others by John Dramani and others. In a syllogical or mathematical equation, therefore, this is what I said, and I quote, moral obligation, why shall, should be a legal obligation. Considering the travesty of the reasoning of the Supreme Court in Niyakoto over 50 years ago, one cannot ignore the yearnings of Ghanaians who cried to the lawmaker to replace the word should with shah in order to subs do substantive justice in like cases. It must be said that the drafters of the 1992 Constitution, like their predecessors in 1969 and 1979, heard the cries and supplications of the then Supreme Court, and with a heralding siren and typical fanfare, answered the prayers of many Ghanaians by adopting the use of Shah whenever they intend a peremptory order. Specifically, on the protection of fundamental human rights, the drafters in Article 12 one states, the fundamental human rights and freedoms enshrined in this chapter shall be respected and upheld by the executive, legislature, and the judiciary, and all other organs of government and its agencies. I must emphasize that we owe, this, we owe all these provisions to what happened to Akoto and seven others. It is in this vein that the Ghana School of Law is very grateful to His Majesty Otu for Osetutu de Asantehine, who saw the wisdom in instituting these lectures and provided the seed money of two, then 200 million cities, now 20,000, for these lectures. We also wish to thank the family of Bafo Osakoto for their continued assistance and collaboration. It must be placed on record that this year's edition of the Ria Koto Memorial Lecture has been put on a different level, and it is our hope that it will continue to stay there. It is the wish of the management of the Ghana School of Law that the SRC of the school should continue to devise ways of making the Akoto Memorial Lectures worthwhile. On this note, I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Acting Director of the Ghana School of Law, Mr. Maxwell Opoku Ajiman. Ladies and gentlemen, I have been advised that I'm at liberty to take off my mask when I come here. So I do take that liberty. And anytime soon, the Jaco Nimo and the Adademu Agofuma will be giving us a musical interlude. So they are advised to hold themselves in readiness. As I indicated, ladies and gentlemen, as and when we receive notice of other dignitaries, we shall inform you accordingly and acknowledge them. Now, we have with us the Honorable Augustine Collins in team, Deputy Minister of Local Government, designate an MP for Offenso North. Honorable, you're welcome. 
We also have in our presence the Honorable Mayor of Kumasi, Honorable Osei BMG. Honorable, you're welcome. We have Honorable Joseph Kwesi Asimin, District Chief Executive, Bosomche District Assembly. Mr. Richard appear to Deputy Judicial Secretary in charge of Northern Sector here with us. We have Mrs. Juliet Edueji, Registrar, Ghana School of Law. We have her deputy, Miss Marian Atawahin, also here with us. Let me also acknowledge the presence of Justice Kofi Akroya, Supervising High Court Judge Kumasi. My Lord. And let me finally mention that Professor Lydia Aporin Kansan, Dean of the Faculty of Law, KNUST, is also representing the Vice Chancellor of KNUST. And finally, let me also acknowledge myself as an alumnus of Faculty of Law, KNUST. Shall we now have Ejeko Nimbo and Adade Mwagufuma for a musical internet? Grandson Kuridi, Nana, what you are doing puzzles me. You are 90 and planting coconut tree, knowing very well that you might not live to enjoy the fruits of your labor. The old man smiled. I know I wouldn't live to enjoy the fruits of my labor. And even if I should live beyond that, I may not have the dental capacity to enjoy it. I'm planting the coconut tree because of you and children yet unborn. I could be a could be. Now, crown in the wine. Shami Bafo say ya could do. Kakamu, kakamyo, minuro kakamyo Kakamu apu kwa mwasi anansi Odom se sire kusi anansi mundo mfwe 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 Anansi
So very much. Nimo and the other Muagufuma. Ladies and gentlemen, His Lordship, Justice of the Court of Appeal, Justice Sir Dennis Ajay, represents the Chief Justice, His Lordship Eniye Bua, on this occasion. Shall we receive justice? Sir Dennis A.J. for the opening statement. Chairman for the occasion, Mr. Kwam Pieni, Anantahine representing Otum for Osetu II, Honorable Godfred Yabu Adame, Attorney General of the Republic of Ghana, Professor Mike Okui, former Speaker of Parliament. Then we talk about Honorable Minister of Education, then the, the Acting Director Law School. I think here I may um, seek permission to stand by the previous protocols, and I believe it is granted by the chairman. The chief justice had wished to be here in person, but nature has made it, made it impossible for him to be here. It was yesterday afternoon, about 2 o'clock, when he finally decided that nature will not permit him and asked me to come this morning to represent him. And I convey his felicitations to everybody here, particularly the law students. Memorial lectures are organized to remember the role played by a person whether living or dead, which is of significance to the community. Bafo Osai Akuto is being celebrated today, and this is the 16th occasion. He was a chief who reigned for decades, and he was a statesman, and he fought against oppression and tyranny. Bafo Osai Akuto, a senior linguist to Asantehne, could have withdrawn from all other activities and concentrate on his chiefly activities. But he saw the need to fight for the vulnerable. Bafo Osai Akuto is celebrated as a statesman by the fact that he exhibited great wisdom and objectivity in dealing with important public issues. He spoke against violations of fundamental human rights and freedoms, and at the same time, sought to promote principles of rule of law. 
Bafo Osayako to a senior linguist and seven others, as we all know, were arrested, detained under LN310 of Section 2 of the Preventive Detention Act 1958 for acting in a manner prejudicial to the security of the state. There is no definition for acting in a manner prejudicial to the security of the state. And that power was exercised by the president and passed on to his successor in title. So once there is no definition, then it is subject to be abused. Bafo Osai Akoto, when he was arrested and detained, taught that under the 1960 Constitution, by virtue of Article 13, he could seek redress in court for a declaration to be made on the Preventive Detention Act, which was seemingly inconsistent with the spirit of their Constitution. He sought the matter was determined by the Supreme Court, and as was said a moment ago by the acting director of the law school, the court, instead of looking at the spirit of the law, limited itself to the letter of the law and substantially distinguished shah from should and came to the conclusion that by virtue of the word should it was not a bill of right and therefore unenforceable provision the celebration of akoto memorial lectures is to remind the courts not to be pedantic in dealing with the constitution and any application or interpretation of the Constitution which will impede its single growth, which would impede its single growth, must be avoided. But for Osakoto, as a statement, is reminding students here it is not enough to meet here annually, to have an annual ritual and leave. Why do we say that Bafo Akoto was a statesman and must be celebrated? I will urge you to read at your own leisure time Article 41 of the Constitution. Duties of citizens. Bafo Osakoto stands for the fact that everybody, everybody body is required to be honest and you must work conscientiously in your lawful choosing occupation. We must protect and preserve public property and expose those who abuse the system and waste public funds and public property. You are to contribute to the community where you live. Then you must defend the constitution and other laws of Ghana. You are to cooperate with law enforcement agencies to ensure that laws of the land bite and order is maintained. And you must work collectively to protect and safeguard the environment. We cannot talk about the celebration of a statesman of the caliber of Bafo Osai Akoto without talking about our duties as citizens. Always we talk about rights and privileges, but we must perform our 
duties as citizens. If he did not perform his duty, we wouldn't have met here this morning to celebrate him. That was what he did, and we are here to achieve the same purpose. So we urge you all that we must fight collectively to protect and safeguard our environment. He was a chief par excellence and did not use his position to exploit others. Indeed, we could conclusively state that Bafor Akoto was a person of integrity. And he's a role model, and his life should change us for the better. The annual celebration should not be a lip service, but must inculcate in us the spirit of patriotism. That was what he did and suffered for it. And at the end of the day, he is being celebrated as such. On behalf of the Honorable Chief Justice, Justice Eni Yeboah, I wish all of us a very successful celebration. And thank you. Thank you very much. His Lordship Justice Dennis Ajay, representative of the Chief Justice of the Republic of Ghana. Ladies and gentlemen, anytime soon we shall have the address by the Honorable Attorney General and Minister for Justice. But before then, as I indicated earlier on, we shall acknowledge the presence of the following Justices of the High Court and senior members of the Bar. We have with us His Lordship Justice Samuel Obin Diawu. Justice Emmanuel Senor Amedahe is also with us. We have Justice Krufa Ade. His Lordship Justice Charles Bintum is also with us. Let's also acknowledge the presence of the following senior members of the bar. We have the Ashanti Bar President in the person of Mr. Kwame Uzu Sechre. We have Mr. Kwame Boafu, senior member of the bar and also senior law lecturer, Ghana School of Law. We have the immediate past Ashanti Bar President, Mr. Francis Kofi, with us. Shall we also acknowledge the presence of one of the grandsons of Bafour Osaya Kutu, in the person of the Honorable Uruku Edu, Deputy Minister of Energy Designate and MP for Efija Kabre South. Honorable, you are welcome. We have other lecturers and the administrative staff of the Ghana School of Law as and when we receive their names, we shall inform you. Let me finally acknowledge the presence of the former registrar of the Ghana School of Law, Nana Osei Bonsu. Nana, you're welcome. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, shall we receive the Honorable Minister of Justice, and Attorney General, Mr. Godfrey Yaboa Dami, for his address. Thank you very much. Representative of the Chief Justice of the Republic of Ghana, His Lordship, Justice Said and the the Right Honorable Speaker of the Seventh Parliament of Ghana, Right Honorable Professor Aaron Michael Kwe, 
Mr. Kwame Pienim, distinguished economist, and in fact, the chairman for the occasion. Dr. Efuye Akutu, my own colleague and also Minister for Agriculture, colleague ministers and deputy ministers designate, the director of the Ghana School of Law and director of legal education in Ghana, Mr. Maxwell Pukwajiman, the numerous distinguished guests, indeed, the representative of Otunfo, Nana Anantahini, and Adan Anandum, the mayor of Kumasi, the numerous district chief executives in the room, and party executives, I can recognize party chairman, won't be in the house. <laughs> distinguished guests, friends of the media, ladies and gentlemen, as Attorney General and Minister for Justice, I consider it nothing short of a duty to participate in a program which seeks to culminate events leading to the adjudication by the Supreme Court of Ghana of a case whose judgment has become a scar on the conscience of the nation. The facts of the Ray Akutu case, I believe, will be amply set out in the speeches of the keynote speaker, Dr. Efri Akutu, as well as the right honorable Professor Michael Quay, I will thus not bore you with a narration of same. Safe to say that one cannot miss the ordinary status of the citizens of Ghana, the appellant in the case. Indeed, apart from Bafo Osiako II and Anna Entribu Siako, who possess the traps of nobility and dignified status, by virtue of being the senior linguist of Asantehine and Nkonfohine of Kumasi, respectively. All the other appellants in the matter cannot, by any stretch of imagination, be described as clothed with the gaps of nobility or what one may describe in modern day appellants as honorable, although that term has been abused and misapplied. The other appellants in the matter were A, a lorry driver, storekeeper, letter writer, or chenier, transport owner, and in fact, one of them, the seventh appellant, was described simply as of Kumasi. Definitely, he had no fixed place of abode or a recognizable address. Indeed, the Lord, as the good book says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 28, God chooses the lowly things of this world and the, the, the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. End of quote. One lesson to be drawn from the fact of the Akoto case is that an ordinary pe person or one belonging to the masses is largely at the receiving end of the law that we enact and are most affected by the adverse consequences thereof. It becomes self-evident that in building a society anchored the rule of law, we must be guided by the effect of laws and systems we put in place on the ordinary people, and not only the high and mighty or a specific class that we target. In quite an irresistibly powerful way, the case of Akoto and seven others teaches us to be mindful of the collective good of the laws that we enact as a nation, as all facets of society will be affected by the application of the law. Mr. Chairman, it is not for nothing that Akutu and Seven others occupies a prominent place in the scheme of Ghana's constitutional development. A cocktail of factors, as is often the case, as is often the case in most landmark decisions of our court, has collaborated to place that case on a pedestal, in my estimation, akin to the events that have become characterized as Martyrs Day, June 30th. Firstly, the gallantry, bravery, principle, and resilience attributes to which, as was earlier alluded to by the Master of Ceremonies for the occasion, has already been paid by His Excellency, the President, in a speech last year, ought to be fully recognized and appreciated. Further, the records will show that a year before arguing the matter, Dr. J.B. Dankwa had lost an election to Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. 
he proceeded to campaign vigorously against the Preventive Detention Act, which had been enacted in 1958. The Ghana Bar Association remained silent, although they protested vigorously against Kwame Nkrumah's attempt to divest them of their wigs and gowns. The Bar actually considered Dr. J.B. Dankwa's human rights advocacy as quixotic and merely philosophical. Some even doubted his legal argument. His spirits were low, and I dare say, crashed. Came along this case, involving some lowly men suffering the brand to the Preventive Detention Act. And boy, he rose to the occasion. The commanding and dom dominant performance delivered by Dr. J.B. Dankwa can only be described as legendary. For the benefit of all gathered here, the submissions of both Dr. J.B. Dankwa and, and, and the Attorney General of the day, Geoffrey Bing, both powerful in every regard, are captured in the second edition of Jando and Griffith, Volume 2, Part 1. Indeed, I described Dr. Dunkway's submissions as legendary because all those, although those submissions did not prevail in the Akutu case, history has shown that it later on became the cornerstone for the protection of human rights in this country. All constitutions enacted in this country have since incorporated Dr. Dunkway's argument in the Akutu case as a yastic for protection of human rights, constitutionalism, separation of powers, and observance of the limitations of the rule of law. Mr. Chairman, permit me to quote from one passage in the record of Dr. Dunkway's argument when answering Attorney General Joseph Bain's proposition that the concept of judicial review was alien to the constitutional architecture of the country and that same was inherently American, Dr. Dunkway submitted in these terms. And I quote, to propose that this fundamental universal principle of the exercise of their sovereignty by a free people is peculiarly American, is to, say, is to show a shocking misunderstanding of the nature of self-government. To deny that these universal principles have influenced other countries in the development of their constitutions is to deny what is self-evident. One only has to compare Article 1 of the Republican Constitution of Ghana with the opening words of the American Declaration of Independence to see a universal principle repeated in both documents. The declaration st st states, I'm sorry, that to secure these rights, life, liberty, and happiness, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. Article 1 of the Constitution of Ghana begins, the powers of the state derives from the people by whom certain powers, by whom certain of these powers are now conferred on the institutions established by this constitution, end of quote. But Adam Kwak proceeded to argue and later on had this to say in reaction to the Attorney General's obnoxious conception of the supremacy of Parliament. And I quote, two things cannot be supreme at the same time. The Parliament cannot be superior in its creator. The Parliament cannot be superior to its creator, the Constitution. Thus, Parliament is inferior to the Constitution and subject to its provisions. This is the true meaning. I respectfully submit of the rule of law upon which, in the words of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the constitution is based. Thus, the term of supremacy of parliament is meaningless in relation to the Ghana constitution. The courts have both the power and the duty of maintaining the supremacy of the constitution. End of quote. The principles contained in this argument, put forth by Dr. Dankwa in Riyakutu, have become the hub around which the wheel of Ghana's democratic institutions since 1969 have revolved. They encompass the following. One, a round acceptance of the concept of judicial review, enabling the superior court to declare as unlawful and ultra-virus actions of the executive and legislature. Two, the power of the Supreme Court to make consequential orders. Three, an unreserved promulgation of a bill of rights, fully captured in, for instance, chapter five of the Constitution 1992. Mr. Chairman, it will remain on my part to fail to take note of the sharp, artful, and indeed adroit advocacy of the attorney of the day, Geoffrey Bing. Not because I'm attorney general too, but simply because the standard of advocacy in that case was par excellence, both on behalf of the state and the appellant. So Geoffrey Bing made this statement. My loss, I should at the outset call your lordship's attention to one authority quoted by Lord Atkin in his dissenting judgment in Liversage and Anderson, 
reported in 1942, appeal cases, page 206, House of Laws. The authorities support and strongly support the arguments put forward by my learned friend on both heads. It was the only authority which Lord Atkin was able to find to support the type of opposition which has been advanced by my learned friend. And I have myself been unable to find any other authority other than that quoted by Lord Atkin. I therefore put it forward so that it may be given full consideration by your lordships. Lord Atkin said, I know of only authority, only one authority which might justify the suggested method of construction. When I use the word Humpty Dumpty, said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what it chose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be the master? That is all. Quoted from Through the Looking Glass. If we bring continued, the essence of Lord Atkins arguments was that the court must give the same weight and meaning to words, whatever the context of the times, and must not be led by the existence of an emergency into placing a strained and unnatural construction on terms used in the statute. Of course, Geoffrey Bain's arguments prevailed. However, a further argument made by him, which was appealed by the Supreme Court, would forever put an indelible stain on the decision and become, as I said in the beginning, a scar on the conscience of a nation. This was as follows, and I quote, In my submission, the object of the declaration is to impose on every president a moral obligation. Article 13, Clause 1 provides, in fact, a political yardstick by which the conduct of the president can be measured. If the president departs from any of the principles set out in the declaration, the people have a remedy, not through the use of the court, but through the use of the ballot box, end of quote. This argument by Geoffrey Bink was appealed, but same would forever drive that Irish former Labour MP of the British Parliament and Queen's Council into their records as a shocking, unrelenting, and perhaps unfortunately so, a champion for autocracy and impunity. Mr. Chairman, it is insightful to note that Geoffrey Bink provided a clue about the inspiration of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah for the enactment of the PDA in his book, Reap the World Hand, at page 222 thereof. The chairman indeed had brought the original copy of the Geoffrey Bain's book, and if I may quote from the relevant part. He said, to the African ministers, self-government implied the right to use in the national interest the same powers and methods of government which the colonial authorities had employed. If denial of assets to the court was justified in 1948, why was it wrong in 1957? The Labour government, which had supported it in 1948, stood not only for enlightened colonial rule, but even for colonial self-government. It was not as if Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's cabinet was trying to justify their action on the ground that what they proposed had previously been done by some reactionary and oppressive regime of the past. They were only exercising the type of power which even Lord Atteo's government had admitted was essential sometimes to employ. Why then should there be so much criticism when a popularly elected government and when, why then should there be so much criticism when a popularly elected government used it in Ghana and no protest, even by the left wing of the Labour Party, when it had been used against Dr. Kwame Nkrumah and Dr. and Akwaji by a colonial regime, admittedly unrepresentative of the people? Geoffrey Bing also provided an insight into the mindset of Kobe Duse, the Minister for Interior, who masterminded the execution of the Preventive Detention Act at page 225 of the book. And he stated that, I myself went off to spend a few days holiday with Dr. Kwame Nkuma at Hafasni, the western frontier village where he had grown up. We were bathing in the surf when the police superintendent in charge of the Prime Minister's radio link with Accra waved to us from the bench, from the beach, I'm sorry. There was an important message. It was from Kobo who had been appointed a day or so before as Minister for the Interior, announcing that he had informed the immigration authorities that he could not approve the issue of a re-entry permit for 
the advocate Kisofa Shawcross. Koboidise had a logical case for his peculiar point of view. His experience with the law had led him to believe that the courts were merely places where politics were pursued by other means. On the night of independence, he stood beside Dr. Kwame Kuma as he addressed for the first time the independent people of Ghana, wearing a prison cap embroidered with the letters PG, prison graduate. To him, any criminal conviction under colonialism was the best testimonial obtainable of political rectitude, and he let no one forget that he, like Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, had been imprisoned by his previous regime. He regarded a court primarily as an institution through which a government, colonial or otherwise, imposed its policy behind a cloak of magisterial prosperity, a cloak of magisterial propriety, I'm sorry, and it must be said that there were incidents in past legal history of the Gokus which could be cited to justify his argument. Mr. Chairman, with this mindset, could we say, all relentlessly pursued the implementation of the Preventive Detention Act. I cannot conclude these brief remarks without drawing attention to a fundamental prerogative for a rule of law, as established in the legal arguments of Otadankwa. It is this that apart from ensuring that the quality of the law is such as will be in the ultimate interest of the nation, the application of the law ought not to be discriminatory.